Welcome back, Literary Slummers, to another episode of Shelf Aware, the podcast where we challenge each other to read books outside of our comfort zones. I'm one of your hosts, Anna. And I'm Em. Uh, this fortnight on Shelf Aware, we had a submission from friend of the podcast, Morgan. Shout out to Morgan. Um, who Hi, Morgan. <laughs> who earlier this summer <laughs> pointed out that there was a new book in the Anonymous series of... Uh, Found Diaries, um, called Breaking... Thanks so much, Morgan. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Called Breaking (laughs) Bailey. And we read that. (laughs) We did. Um, First thoughts. Um, (laughs) First thoughts are that this was such a low-stakes book about (laughs) meth and addiction. I was so frustrated the whole time. This was incredibly boring for most of the book and then it got not boring but in a way that I didn't appreciate yeah yeah it just got wacky (laughs) I will say now those of you who have been listening to us for a long long time because I think this was like one of our early double digit episodes I think Annie's baby was episode nine oh oh even pre pre double digits but yeah, we read Annie's Baby, which is another one of these anonymous diaries. Uh, and we talked a little bit about the provenance of that one on that episode. But the weird thing is, so, okay, so the anonymous diaries are kind of a series, kind of not. Essentially, it was a fad that was kicked off by the very well-known drug book, Go Ask Alice. Uh, which was very popular in the 70s. Um, I'm trying to remember if it was published late 60s or early 70s. But in any case, it was very, very popular and was you know, supposed to be like a real true book that really happened to a real child. And then she died at the end and yeah. left behind this diary. Thanks, Thanks for that, too. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that one, it's pretty well accepted that it probably wasn't a real teenager writing the book that it was a woman named Beatrice Sparks and Beatrice Sparks did come forward and was like yeah I edited this book but she does claim that or she did I should say spoiler alert she is dead um we think (laughs) uh that that, um she she edited the book but it was from like a series of diary entries from a real kid that she knew so that's probably nonsense, but like, let's give her the benefit of the doubt. Uh, she then sure, re- yeah. went on to write several more of these books, or in her words, edit them. And some of them were published by Simon and Schuster. So now they have several anonymous diaries of their own that were written after Beatrice Sparks' death. And this is one of them. So I think Annie's Baby was like, the last one that was a, that can be attributed to Sparks. Um, and there have yes. been a few more since then, including this one that we read, Breaking Bailey. Now, I went on a bit of a deep dive to see if I could figure out <laughs> who the fuck wrote this book. It was Bailey. Bailey it was Bailey, wrote this of course. Book, and... Well, I have four theories uh, after okay. my research. Um, I will say that the thing that convinces a lot of people that Beatrice Sparks is the writer, not the editor of the other books, is that she is the sole copyright claimant. Um, if you go to like to the copyright uh, files and look look up these books on the ones that she's mm-hmm. attributed to as editor, like she's got copyright on them, which seems suspicious if a different person wrote them. Um, She's just stealing identities. Right. So my first thought was to go and look up the copyright for this book, which I did. uh, And I couldn't find Mm -hmm. it on the copyright, Uh like on their website, which I think is just because it came out this year. And I think the website is a little bit behind in terms of because I checked some other books from this year as well. And I couldn't find all of them. Um, Okay. So I looked up another in the series, Calling Maggie May, which was published uh, in 2012, I think. And that one does not have an author list or this an author listed the sole copyright holder is simon and schuster incorporated so i think 
that that would probably be the case for this book as well. So the copyright thing was kind of a dead end. Um, so the first theory that I want to throw out there is the one that Simon and Schuster would support, which is this was written by a real teenager. Um, maybe the names are no. changed and some details are moved no. around. <laughs> maybe stuff was edited like um, Beatrice Sparks claims with her books that someone edited it to make it um, more flowing and make it more of a narrative and maybe cut out like the probably 20 the or so parts. pages Right, the 20 or so pages where the teenager talked about how hot her boyfriend's butt was, which is definitely a thing that would happen in Teenager's Diary, but didn't happen in this one. Um, so, okay, so that's what Simon & Schuster would like us to believe, that this was written by a real teen. Uh, to kind of counter that, I would point to the fact that in the front piece, there is a the typical disclaimer of, this is a work of fiction, Um which I, I guess, again, you could say, oh, it's a work of fiction, but it's based on something that really happened. Maybe, probably not. I would also counter that this doesn't sound like any teen that has ever lived ever, and certainly not one in, like, 2018. No, not in 2019. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so probably not would be my... There's not my... enough memes in this diary for me to no, believe and that a teenager wrote it. All of the brands that they reference are, like, stuff that someone not a teen in 2019 would use um yeah so there's option number two which is probably the actual truth that simon and schuster hired a ghostwriter and the ghostwriter wrote the book and they were given specs guess. on what the book was supposed to, what plot points the book was supposed to hit and they just wrote that book and Honestly, that's probably what happened, it seems yeah. like. The fact that Simon Schuster holds all of the copyright kind of implies that probably the person who actually wrote this was someone hired by Simon and Schuster and didn't care if their name was anywhere on the book. Probably a ghostwriter. <laughs> um, they were getting paid. I I kind of have this kind of like a, a addendum, I guess, to the ghostwriter theory. I have this very okay. loose theory that the ghostwriter could have been this woman named, um, oh, fuck, now I've lost it already, uh, Linda Glovac, who okay. was, who is an author, mainly of children's books, I think. I think this is the same Linda Glovac. It's possible that there are two different Linda Glovacs who are both authors. But in the late 90s, Linda Glovac wrote a book called Beauty Queen, and in... Um, Publishers Weekly and the New York Times, they both referenced her as the author of Go Ask Alice. So, like, hmm. I kind of had this, like, theory that maybe she helped to ghostwrite Go Ask Alice in the first place and has been ghostwriting all of these books since Weird. then. Weird. What did Dr. S have to say about that? Nothing. That's the thing. There's, like, there. this is in an article from the New York Times, and it's in Publishers Weekly from that time. And it's like a footnote. They're both like, oh, yeah, she helped to write Go Ask Alice. And, like, they don't Weird. say where they got that information from. Like, if they got that from Linda Glovac or if, like, they just guessed or what. Because, like, the themes of Beauty Queen are very, There's very similar to Go Ask Alice. Well, the thing, so <laughs> the thing is, the Linda Glovac, who is a children's book author, if that is the same Linda Glovac, I don't think she's old enough to have written Go Ask Alice. So... Unless she was the original Alice. Unless she, she was Alice. Die Alice end. dies at the Spoilers. end of Go Ask Alice. So, um, <laughs> so probably not actually Linda Glovac, but it, it would be funny if it turned out that actually all of these books were all ghostwritten by the same person. Um, I also think that this one <laughs> is very different in terms of style from like Annie's Baby. So I don't think it was the same mm -hmm. writer who, and Annie's Baby is very similar to Go Ask Alice in terms of style. So I, I do think the same person oh, so wrote that. Whiny. I don't think um, necessarily that the same person wrote Breaking Bailey. Um, okay, so theory number three. Uh, this was written by Beatrice Sparks before she died in 2005. Okay. She just was really prescient about a lot of stuff regarding the opioid yeah, crisis. Yeah, that's a that's a kind of a stretch. <laughs> I don't think the 
meth ep- epidemic or the opioid em- epidemic were that bad in 2012? The one thing I would say is that basically all of these drug books by anonymous teens are the same book. So it's possible that she maybe wrote like a rough outline and then someone else, again, edited in the details. Um, but <laughs> I, I feel like probably not, which brings us to my fourth theory. This book was ghostwritten by a ghost. And Beatrice, yes, Sparks, it's haunted. Beatrice Sparks has come from beyond the grave to make sure that people don't do drugs. Her work on Earth has not finished. Oh my gosh, I would believe that one, first of all, because I think that Beatrice Sparks has a lot of um, power in the Mormon church. Mm, mm, <laughs> She's converting lots of, lots of children. Though, though, this book is not, like, not anti-religious, but devoid of all religion. Yes, and I think also this book is not as um, aggressively moralistic as Annie's Baby was. Yeah. I mean, like, this is definitely, spoiler, this is definitely still propaganda. Like, 100%. Mm -hmm. If you listen to our Annie's Baby episode, that's where we came down on Annie's Baby. This is still propaganda. But it is, it it does not seem to have quite the um, hardcore level of, like, moralizing about drug usage that, and various other um, vices that... Annie's Baby and Glass Gals and Jay's Journal Boys, yes, um, that those <laughs> books had. So if it is Beatrice Spark speaking to us from beyond, she must have, like, I don't know, gone to, like, a few ghost meetings where there were some chill people who were like, hey, 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 <laughs> maybe she- chill it on the sex will kill you thing. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe, like... She just realized maybe the afterlife wasn't what she thought it was, and so she had mm. to like reexamine her own beliefs, and then yeah. she didn't get her own those planet to the youth of today. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But um, yeah, those are four equally likely theories. <laughs> yeah, I think I think they all hold the same exact amount of weight, <laughs> <laughs> and we should give equal consideration to all four. As Absolutely. We, as we discussed, one hundred percent. Um, But before we get into the actual book, is there anyone you would recommend this book for? If you are a cult leader who really wants (laughs) to push a certain way of life onto the children of your cult, you should let them read this book and actually all of the Anonymous Diaries series. You should just let them have them. Um, I will say, I think that, I I think it kind of already mentioned that I found this one way less disgusting than Annie's baby. Um, I do think there may be some value in this may have a place for very young teens, like low end of the teen spectrum. Um, Mm. Who are scared of everything. Well, who maybe don't need like a hyper realistic (laughs) examination of drug usage who just like I I wouldn't recommend this for fun but like I don't think I don't think it's the worst anti-drug book in the world um I think that at a certain age maybe you aren't ready for all of the nuances of the conversation around drugs and addictions and this isn't the worst starting point. I would definitely have, like, follow-up conversations with a child reading this book. <laughs> We'd have to talk a lot about the ending of this book if we were to assign this as reading for anybody. Yes. It I maybe was wouldn't just... give them the ending. I maybe would just take well, the Just, like, out. excerpts maybe? Like, I don't know. Yeah. I just... This is such a weird book. It's such a weird scare tactic. It's a it's a very weird book. It's a very weird book that either needed a lot more math or a lot less. Like just take it out out altogether because honestly, like whatever. (laughs) So stupid. It was already doing so much. Like we're gonna get into it, but it's already doing so much in terms of like. It's talking about addiction to prescription drugs. It's talking about, like, emotionally abusive relationships. And I actually think it did a pretty good job of that. Yeah, I think that's true. 
but I don't know why the meth was in here. It didn't. And then, and to also so name the book after the show Breaking Bad, or I yes. mean, like the term Breaking Bad, whatever. But more famously, the television show about a chemistry teacher who starts to make meth called Breaking Bad. And then, like, the meth is just kind of in the background for most of this book. Yes. It is so strange. I don't get why they need... I guess really why they did meth is because they've done every other drug in these yeah. books. Like... They had to do something, but it was, it's just so weird that like, like it's a book about meth, but it's, but it's not, not at all. Like, it's a book about, it's not about meth. It's a book about getting addicted to pills. They could have just gone with that. Like that's a big, that could probably be, right. they could just, whatever, whatever. I feel like that's, and that's as far as like, as a propaganda piece, as an anti-drug piece, um, like. I see the value in having a story about a child in a school where they feel like pressured and overwhelmed and they get addicted to prescription drugs. Like I see that. I do not see the value in having a book that's like, don't cook meth kids. Cause like, honestly, honestly, who is, who is this this book for? And like the, the, um, the backgrounds of the characters too. It's like all of these rich, beautiful white kids. Yes. Cooking meth. I yes. Just- <laughs> I'm just like the the people that might be at risk for getting involved in the drug trade are not going to see themselves in these characters. Mm-hmm. And the people who would see themselves in these characters are going to be like, why would I bother doing that? That seems very stupid. And like, I have money already. Exactly. Why would I need to do this? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god well i guess we can just go ahead and get into the plot then what little there was yeah i tried to hit all the major points but honestly a lot of this book was bailey just whining either about whether or not her boyfriend loved her whether or not she was doing well in school and how weird her roommate was so which like that's a fine ya book like there's a lot of ya books where like that's pretty much it yes. but you can't do that and be like, it's a story about meth because I care about the meth way more I, yeah. than this shit. I wanted a lot of dirty meth usage. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> Bailey is a junior who just transferred to a new private boarding school called Prescott because her mom has recently passed away and her dad remarried this rich lawyer woman so they can afford to send Bailey and her younger sister to different boarding schools. Just that, a th- like, are there still boarding schools like this in the U.S.? Am I just too poor and I don't realize? Um, I think you're too poor. Okay. I think there are definitely board. Well, I say it and now I'm like, maybe not. <laughs> maybe that's all. Let me look it up. Hold up. U.S. I mean, like, there's like there's still in the be, U.K. Right. right? Yeah, for sure. But uh, yeah, there definitely are because there's a list of the fifty best of them. So. Oh wow, there are more than fifty. There's at least 50, because those are the top 50. But Jeez. they have names like um, Deerfield Academy and Phillips Exeter Academy and Groton School. Groton so, School. Like, That's where I want to go. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, but Bailey feels like she doesn't fit in and because she comes from a poor background like me, apparently, and mm. is eager to latch and on by, to... And by poor, we mean like middle class is what she oh, comes yeah. from she's mm-hmm. not poor no it, it's completely ridiculous that she's being set up as this like oh woe is me i'm so like un unwealthy and i don't have the means and it's like i'm part of the unwashed masses <laughs> like you're not oppressed bailey calm down yeah i have to wear ballet flats that i got at a department store <laughs> instead of you're not a, you're not oppressed because you can't afford lululemon like you need to chill yeah, Lululemon. Oh my god. <laughs> um, she so she's like she doesn't fit in, and she's eager to latch onto the first social sc- social group that will have her, and also she's keeping a diary. Obviously, we're reading it. <laughs> <laughs> Bailey happens to be a whiz kid at chemistry. She's like the so stupid. I can't name a famous chemist, but if I could, she would be that. And um, she's uh, approached was Marie Curie chemistry. She was like radiation and stuff. There's probably some she chemistry. She did radiation, in there, right? probably, maybe. 
<laughs> We're really revealing Guys, our scientific literature yeah. here. <laughs> Guess what Em and I like more than science? Everything else. Um, No, I don't know. We like things. We like science. Science is all right. Um, So she's a real whiz kid at this chemistry, and she's approached by a group of students, Drew, Katie, and Warren, who ask her to be part of their science club. Turns out, they're not getting together to talk about the periodic table of elements or other science things I can name off the top of my head. <laughs> but they are actually making meth. And they Okay, are... okay, okay. <laughs> this was 20 pages into the book. This is 20 pages was, into yeah. a 360-page book. And I'm like, yep. oh, wow, this book is going zero to 60. Like, we're going to get so in-depth into meth culture and then like nothing but like okay the setup of this the premise of this they're like we need bailey to join because she's so good at chemistry for why for why she doesn't need to be good at chemistry for this it's just (laughs) like i get that meth is a complicated process i don't want to like shade anyone who is really good at cooking meth i'm sure that's a very great skill Uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but there reaches a point i assume where being good at chemistry at a high school level which is like knowing what avogadro's number is isn't going to really help you like because it is just following instructions like if they were trying to figure out how to make meth in the first place and they, they were, were like inventing meth <laughs> If they were inventing meth, I could see why they would need, like, a chemistry whiz kid. But they're not. They have, like, a process that they found and they're following. So, as and again, I've never cooked meth. Maybe I'm wrong about this. Maybe you do need to be real, real good at chemistry. But, like, I feel like it's probably (laughs) just, like, can you fill a pipette correctly? Can you make sure stuff doesn't get over a specific temperature? Which you don't need to be good at chemistry for that. You need to be good at following directions. That's a different thing. Yeah, all you need to do is be good at reading, I feel like, to make meth. Maybe Essentially. at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't they don't take any meth themselves. Well they do like to make sure that they, I guess, made a meth. But then after that they know they don't really partake like <laughs> they're not they're not active meth doers. They just make the product and they want to make it, they rationalize it by saying they want to make a very pure, clean, and safe question mark version of this drug so that people aren't taking dirty meth and dying as much, I guess. Okay. 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 So, like, (laughs) Warren... He's kind of like the chemistry mastermind behind all of this. And he has this tragic backstory where his brother died because of a heroin addiction. And so Warren then turns around and is like, if people are going to be taking drugs, I want to make sure they're good drugs so that they don't die like my brother did to bad heroin. I don't know. Okay. And I mean, like, I just... Like, I do, I, I, Jesus Christ, I kind of get the logic there because it is a similar logic to, like, the push to legalize, decriminalize various drugs that, like, if things are, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Regulated, then Uh they would theoretically be safer. Like, okay, like, I do get that, but I don't know. It just seems like such a leap of logic for a child to be like, because he was a child when like even more so than he is now, like they're like 17 years old now, but like they've been doing this, they say for like, this is their third year doing it. So they've been doing it since they were freshmen. Yeah. So like for a 14 year old to be like, my brother died because of a drug overdose. So I want to make drugs to make the world safer. (laughs) Just seems like, (laughs) That doesn't seem logically sound to me. No. No. (laughs) No, no. And he was just, boy had a lot of issues. He needed to work out with a therapist. And Mm -hmm. instead he just took it out on 
with the drug using population of the city where they lived in. I will say at least he had a motivation. I still don't know what the fuck Drew and Katie were doing. Like what was the Who point even knows? They weren't even of, characters. They were well, Katie kinda was. Katie was something. Drew was She's, yeah. Drew was just extra. Drew was so weird to me because at one point, um, like Katie gets weirdly villainized by all of the female characters get weirdly villainized by this book mm-hmm. where like they're all kind of petty and lying and backstabby and whatever and won't just tell Bailey the truth about what's going on but try to manipulate her. Right. Um, but like there is a point where Bailey's like, okay, Warren has told her that Drew has told him that Katie is like a tease and won't like s- commit to being with Drew. Katie, mm-hmm. in the meantime, has told Bailey that um, Drew is a tease. It's the reverse that Dr- that yes. Drew is a tease. Yes. So like, okay, Bailey is in processing this is like, well, if I have to believe Drew or Katie, I'd probably side with Drew. And I'm like. Okay, but based on what? You've, like, not talked to Drew in this entire book. I don't understand why you're siding with Drew. And also, it would have been so easy for that to be, like, if I have to believe Warren or Katie, because she's getting the information from From Warren. Warren. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, (laughs) why are you bringing Drew into this at all? And why do you trust him so much? I don't understand. Because they all trust each other implicitly hardcore. That's, like, the big tenet of Science Club. We all trust each other all the time with everything, our lives, our business, our drugs. I just, it was so flimsy. I, I, I feel like at least on the part of, to some extent, I'm like, that makes sense to me because not that that makes sense that they would actually trust each other, but it makes sense to me that they would push that to Bailey. Mm-hmm. Cause Bailey is obviously like, like I kind of expected that at some point, she's going to be the scapegoat. Yeah. I expected that at some point, they were going to be like, something was going to come out where they were like, of course we didn't go after Bailey because she is so fucking smart. She's not that smart. We went after her because she's a, like she's alone and has no support system. And we knew we could draw her into this and have like yep. an easy person to do the grunt work. Mm-hmm. Like, but they didn't. No. They went the opposite they way. They were like, oh, Bailey, her. you're so good at, <laughs> you, you're so good at meth. Like, <laughs> you're so good at reading directions and following through with them wow jesus uh, so after after some hemming and hawing ba- bailey decides to join science club because she is desperate for friends and money so she can fit in with these richer kids so drew makes bailey film this mysterious collateral which they don't refer they don't tell us what it is until the end of the book but I'm going to tell you here because it's stupid. Wait, before you say, what uh-huh. did you think it was? I thought it was um, naked pictures or naked, like, something sexual. A hundred percent, right? Yes. Yes. Because she won't talk about it. And that's the only thing that would make sense. Like, I guess, like, the ghostwriter decided that they already were tackling the issues of um, meth cooking, prescription pill addiction, and bad relationships. They didn't want to throw in, like child porn yeah as well which, i guess i guess that <laughs> that's a good place to draw the line <laughs> um, but no it's just this video they filmed of bailey admitting that the science club was all her idea which one that's stupid because she just came to school this year and two she blackmailed <laughs> all the other students into joining her into doing this which again it's very stupid she's only known these people for like a month at this point and also if she were the criminal mastermind behind this operation, is she seriously going to stand in front of a video camera and be like, I did it, y'all? I mean, I think we have to give them all a pass because they're little idiot children. Um, yes. Despite them playing big bad drug lord, like they're idiot children. Uh-huh. Uh, and I would also say the other big glaring logical flaw, not in their plan, but in this entire book, is... Um, So they have this, like, drug operation, right, where they're, like, selling meth and they are working really hard on setting up contacts. And at one Mm -hmm. point they're like, oh, we really want to – and, I mean, this is getting a little bit ahead, but they're like, we really want to take a trip all together for spring break. So we're going to work extra hard for the month beforehand so that we can all be out of the school for a week um, for spring break. So, like, what the fuck do they do over summer vacation? 
I have no idea. I was wondering that as well because, <laughs> again, skipping ahead a little bit, Bailey's like, I'm just going to work until the summer and then I'm going to just vanish. But, like, surely they have supplies and demand or they have demands that need to be met during the summer as well. Like, addicts Do don't just... just stop being addicted for three months. Do they just start over every year? Do they have to, like, pick up, like, new people, like... Okay, so we burned all of our bridges with our old with our old dealers because we couldn't give them drugs for three months because we weren't here we're we kids. Were in Connecticut or whatever. Um, because we're children. I don't get it. And I mean I was like, well maybe they like make extra ahead of time, but they have to work like for that's months in advance extra. for the spring break thing. Yeah. So, and exactly, that's a lot more. Like ugh, very stupid. Doesn't make sense. Never addressed in the book. Yeah, no. Nope. I there's a lot of loose ends here that never get answered because of what happens at the end. <laughs> anyway, uh, like we said before, Bailey has a roommate named Emily who she's like kind of friends with, kind of not. And they have some good times, but they also have some bad times. But Emily tries to warn Bailey away from the science club. He's like, don't get too involved with that crew. Warren's gonna get you hooked. I mean, you're like, obviously, she's talking about drugs here. And Bailey's just like, what? <laughs> He's going to get me hooked. What does this mean? Why don't you like Warren? I don't understand. Um, but Bailey starts dating Warren. The amount of just people not fucking coming out and saying what the issue is in this book. Like, I know that's a big complaint, especially in more in romances, really, than in this mm-hmm. sort of genre. But like, Jesus Christ, everybody just needed to stop. It was so irritating. Talking in riddles. Bailey was obviously too stupid to get it. Everybody just needed to be like... I don't even know how she could get into the school, to be honest, with how stupid <laughs> right. she is. She's, she's very good. At, well, we saw, because that was part of the, the story as it goes on, is that she, she is having trouble grades. at school, mm-hmm. specifically English, and she can't understand books. So, like, maybe she's <laughs> just, numbers. just like... No words. Just numbers. She's only numbers. So, like, someone comes up to her and is like, hey, you shouldn't get involved with the meth makers because they'll get you hooked if you know what i'm saying and she's like they're gonna put fish hooks in my mouth i don't understand she's just very literal is this a kind of calculus <laughs> uh, bailey and warren start dating which causes more tension with emily because emily used to date warren i think was that confirmed or is that just another rumor um they both said it okay but they both said it in a way that i thought they were lying so like i don't yeah. know I, I, it was just such weird conversations. It was like one of those situations where like Bailey would be like, oh, what's going on with you and Warren? And Emily would be like, what did he tell you? And Bailey would be like, well, that you two used to date. And Emily would be like, hmm, yes, we used to date. Hmm, yes. If by date you mean exchange meth. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like so it seemed like, Maybe they used to date, or maybe, maybe he was just her drug together. dealer. But because she didn't want to admit that to Bailey, like she glommed on to the dating thing. Or maybe they did used to date because then, like, they keep bringing up parallels between Emily's relationship, Emily's theoretical relationship with Warren, and Bailey's relationship with Warren. I don't know. I don't could know could have gone either way. Very unclear, like most things that matter in this book. <laughs> yeah. So Katie tells Bailey that Emily is some weird stalker type who's still obsessed with Warren. And Bailey sees them around campus having what looks like heated discussions. So, drama for like 3,000 pages about that. And, like we said, classes are hard. Bailey's getting a C in English, which is apparently a failing grade at Prescott. So, like, why not just say she's getting an F? Yeah. (laughs) I didn't understand their grading scale. Seems like your scale is very bad. (laughs) Like, if you're going to make her retake the class. Because she got a C, then just say she got an yeah. F and make C a different grade. I think essentially what it is, and this might be a thing that happens at some schools, is that the school is very, like, into uh, the, all of their kids getting into, like, impressive colleges. Mm-hmm. So maybe the teachers don't, are, are, are like, told uh, don't give anyone anything yeah. below a C because of gpas or something i don't know so that we look good but i also wanted to point out this is i think the second week in a row where we've had a book with just a very stupid (laughs) take on shakespeare because let me see if i can find the the passage okay so katie has to nope not katie that's just the name i first saw when i looked at the page 
Um, so Bailey has to write this essay on Macbeth and at this like really super great school, this is what the essays on Macbeth, the topics are. She says she's decided to write about the prophecy and how it influenced late or how it influenced Macbeth's mm-hmm. actions. And then later she says, um, maybe I'll just do what everyone else is doing and write about how Lady Mac- Lady Macbeth manipulated her husband into doing awful things. So, okay, I do get that that's, like, supposed to be resonant with the text itself, that, you know, there's, like, a meta thing going on here of, like, Bailey and Warren Uh and whatever, blah, blah, blah. But are you telling me that this school, this Uh super uh prestigious school, is having the children write English essays on Macbeth in which their topics are... Summarizing what happens in the play? (laughs) <laughs> basically recapping the plot like what are you doing i think i i question whether or not the person who ghost wrote this book has read Macbeth. <laughs> my thesis on Macbeth is that Macbeth totally stabbed that king. like yes Toast. yes that is the plot I, of Macbeth. i'm writing an essay on um lady Macbeth and whether or not there really is a spot <laughs> <laughs> that would be at least more, like, there's more to that than, like, well, Lady Macbeth told Macbeth to do some <laughs> like, shit. Like, yes, yes. I know. Oh there was God. a prophecy. Yes, I'm aware. So, it was a big plot. Then my question becomes, how do you get a C in that class if you're just <laughs> know, right? regurgitating what you read and not analyzing anything? <laughs> Oh, man. (laughs) She also applies to the summer chemistry program at Princeton and gets waitlisted, which is very sad because Warren is in it and she wanted to spend all summer with him. Blah, blah, blah. So Bailey has this breakdown and is like, my life, I'm bad at my life right now. And Warren, you, how do you like keep it all together? Because you make more meth than me and you still get better grades. And he's like, I take Adderall. You should too. So Bailey starts taking Adderall (laughs) and begins to develop a habit. And I mean, okay. So Bailey discovers that Adderall helps her stay focused in class and she starts to take like three or four of them a day. And then eventually she's like, now I can't sleep. So Warren's like, here, have some Percocets because they help me sleep. So now she's doing Adderall during the day and Percocets. Well, she says she doesn't want to start taking Percocets, but eventually she does. It's, you know. She eases into it. Uh, and then a lot of teenage drama occurs. And then the next big event is that Bailey finds out there is a huge meth problem in the city where the school is located. And a uh, toddler was found wandering around outside a trailer park while his parents were busy getting high off meth. And Bailey becomes super concerned about what they're doing. And she tells Warren that she thinks they should stop just flat out like Bailey you went with them when they went to go like drop off the drugs and make drug exchanges like are, does she really think those are the kind of people they're just gonna be like okay we'll let you guys stop we we didn't realize you were just kids and now you have um, grown a some kind of conscious conscience conscience so we'll, we'll just let you guys out of the drug business I mean, I think that they could pretty easily get out of the drug business by just not leaving their fucking expensive mm. school to go give people drugs. I think that that would be a pretty easy. I because again, it's a school, and they're not gonna be they're not gonna be there in a few months anyway. <laughs> like, it's just, also they're all rich, so like just be like, Daddy, I don't want to go to this school anymore, <laughs> and they can send you to a different one of America's fifty some boarding schools. Like, it's yeah, fine. Yeah, it might not be as good as Prescott, though. Oh, well. Oh, well. Well, well we can't what have that. What was the one up. I wanted to go to? 50 best Groton? boarding schools. Groton or something? Oh, my God. It costs more to go to a boarding school than it costs me to go to college paying out-of-state tuition. Hmm. Holy shit. It's anyway. almost like boarding schools are a luxury that <laughs> most people don't need. And I don't get just it. Just something to piss your money away on. Um, I also want to, I, I want to take a sec to talk about the moral conundrum, I guess, that this novel posits. 
because it is a novel it's fiction um <laughs> which is <laughs> no it's a real diary written by a <laughs> real teenager named the ghost of beatrice sparks <laughs> that this memoir posits um mm-hmm. ba- breaking beatrice's ghost do you think that they are at fault for that toddler because that is that is I essentially mean... what the book the bo- so there's the toddler that runs out into the street like you said well his parents are high on meth and bailey's like oh and she like goes and looks at the house and whatever and is like angry at the parents and the toddler and then she's like angry at herself because it's her fault for giving them the meth and it's like mm-hmm. cool um i don't know that i agree though <laughs> yeah okay and here's the slither in me i think someone was gonna be making meth right mm-hmm. there was already a a need for it and maybe yes katie and drew expanded their market a little bit so maybe it's katie and drew's fault but Mm -hmm. i mean someone was gonna be making (laughs) (laughs) i feel like it's weird to me i guess i could have it seems like that story is taking the stance that it's not the people who are addicted's fault if a bad thing happens while they are on drugs. It is the people who gave them the drugs' fault, right? Mm-hmm. And I mean, like, right. I, I do think to some extent, like, we agree as a society that that is true, like, because we have laws about um, bartenders over serving and things like that. Like, you can be held liable if you mm-hmm. let someone go while they are drunk and they you know, get in a car crash. Like, you can be in trouble for that. Um, So -hmm. to some extent, like, I do think that's true. But A, like you said, someone was going to be doing it, which that's not a great (laughs) excuse, but, you know. (laughs) Um, But there's, like, this weird issue with that in the sense of, like, if the message of this book is – If you are addicted, it's not your fault. It's the drug dealer's fault. Fuck them. Which, that is a stance you can take, I suppose. The ending of this book seems very suspect. Like, the ending of this book is fucked all the way up. If that is the message that we are meant to... if, If what we are meant to take is that if you have a substance abuse problem, Mm -hmm. it is the person who gave you the drugs fault, which is definitely the side Bailey takes at this point. Yes. Then like the end of this book is real. Even Something more else needs up. to happen to someone else. Yes. <laughs> Essentially. Um, like I can understand why Bailey as a 16, 17 year old girl would be very conflicted about her part in this, in this event where a kid almost died. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I just don't know. I just, I can't think of it without like thinking of the book as a whole. So it's hard for me Mm -hmm. to like, be like impartial about this opinion. (laughs) I think Bailey is stupid. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think she's not as stupid as Annie, but that's a low bar. Yeah, no, Annie was very, Annie was a, what was it? A yummy, scrummy <laughs> sports girl. I don't know. Anyway. um, But yeah, essentially, so Warren's like, don't worry about it. You know, this is just, this is the way the world works. So just keep making meth. And she's like, okay, I guess I'll keep making meth. Um, and then she expresses her concerns to Katie who essentially tells her the same thing, but a lot more meaner. <laughs> because turns out Katie is, like, not the best friend that Bailey thought she was. Uh, she's kind of in it for herself. But, like, even before this, Bailey was... Like, she said some really shitty stuff about Katie before Katie did anything to, like, prove her right, yeah. you know? And I was like, I mean, I guess, I guess mm-hmm. it's fine, because you were right in the end. But she was like, there's no way I could trust Katie. Who knows what she would do? And I'm like, based on what? Like, your gut instinct? Because that's not been good so far. Yeah, you are you should not go with your own instincts, Bailey. You should ask someone else, an adult maybe, yes. before you do anything. <laughs> uh, 
But because Bailey has revealed to two members of the science club that she is having second thoughts, she must be punished because she can no longer be trusted. So, I remember that super cool spring break trip that we talked about a little bit earlier. Bailey's punishment is that she doesn't get to go on this trip anymore. And she must instead stay on campus for all of spring break and make a batch of meth using a new recipe. A new recipe. A new recipe that Warren has created. Which is and more potent meth than has ever methed before. Yes, they doubled the toxicity of the meth. But yeah, so she... <laughs> It's like twice, twice the potency, so they can make less and charge more, and people who use meth can use less at a time, but still pay more, I guess. So really, which, no one is benefiting except Science Club. Which, like, also, though, like, I don't know. I don't know how chemistry works, but I feel like something in there doesn't add up where they're like, we're going to use less ingredients, but it's going to be more powerful yeah. And I'm like, but And also it like looked cloudy. Isn't aren't they supposed to be clear when they're really pure? I don't know, man. I yeah, I don't know. I I haven't done math. So like I'm not really I sure. Uh, I'm just going to go on the record and say I've never done math. Yeah, I will go on the record and also say that I've never done math. Um <laughs> <laughs> I know you were all wondering. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, this raises a lot of red flags just like and Bailey just doesn't even realize it. Like she reads, she reads the formula, and then like she says something about how she she tries to work it out for herself, and then she's impressed with how good this formula is. I don't know, but she doesn't like take the time to read the specifics of it until the end of the book when she suddenly makes this realization about the toxicity. And I'm just like, how did you? But like how how did you? How did, it? The how did you then? not notice? Also, if it's like like the whole okay. So, like, the whole premise of the super meth is, like, it will be more meth per yeah, per per piece of meth. Like, there will be more of the yes. meth, the good They're parts. They're denser meth. Denser meth, yes. Super dense meth. <laughs> so, it's, like, obviously, if you are taking a drug and you are taking a higher dosage, but you don't know that it's a higher dosage, that's dangerous. Like, that is a very right. duh thing that I would think even a 16-year-old would be able to suss out for themselves. Mm -hmm. Like, that's it, it shouldn't matter if, like, it, the toxicity of it or whatever. It's like, even if it wasn't more toxic, which I don't know if that just means more potent. Like, again, I don't know how meth works, but, like... Yeah, and even I'm if, not sure the author of this book does No, either, I don't think so. so. Um <laughs> But like, even if even even if it's like two separate variables, like there's toxicity and there's potency. Like, even if it was just the potency, wouldn't you think mm -hmm. that increasing the potency? Like, did she think they were gonna send out little cards with it that were like, "This meth is super potent. Like, be careful, enjoy, <laughs> be safe with your meth." It's like, like when you get a package from Etsy exactly. and they include, like stickers and it's wrapped in like tissue paper with a little card about how to care for your meth. Please leave me a five star review. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, it. Contact me with any issues. Like, oh what did God. what did you think? Like, I don't understand. Like, I I can see not for foreseeing the exact circumstances, but like, you should be able to figure out that if you increase the potency of something, people who are used to taking a certain amount yes. are going to get more of the thing. Like at a yeah. time, it's not good. <laughs> like. Oh I mean, it is God. good for Science Club because they would make a killing with that that method. Oh right, yeah, but <laughs> she's so stupid. Bailey, so Bailey does this. I don't understand why. I don't understand why, when all of the Science Club is out of town, you wouldn't like dismantle the whole Science Club that you'd never wanted to be part of anymore, and then just go and tell somebody, right? She could, well, she keeps being like, they have that, that collateral that they're going to use against me. It's like the collateral that no one's going to believe no is real collateral. Believe it. Also, if go to your fucking principal and be like, Hey, so you know, this super weird, sketchy club that calls themselves science club and doesn't have an academic advisor and meets in the basement for some reason. Like, you know, those <laughs> guys who like are super secretive and 
don't talk yeah. to other students. You know those guys, except at parties where suddenly everybody comes and talks to them. You know those guys? Those guys. Hey, guess what? They're cooking <laughs> meth. You can go downstairs and see it. Also, they made me make a blackmail tape of me saying this. Yes. Like, just get out in front of it, dude. Get out in front exactly. of it. Exactly. You can spin the narrative. Or fuck, like, go to your fucking roommate and be like, hey, so those guys are definitely cooking meth. And she would be like, yes, you're right. I'm so glad you finally figured it out, you dumb piece of shit. And then you can have, like, a conversation. You put all of the clues together. You could have the conversation of, like, oh, like, no, no, no. I've actually been helping them cook meth, but I feel really bad about it. And then, like, maybe you'd have someone on your side instead of just being totally alone in this, you know? Yes. Uh, It's... This the whole conceit of this book just really relies on Bailey being very stupid and <laughs> helpless. You know that one guy who's here um under like mysterious circumstances and runs around in like a beanie and like full length duster that's like trench over, coat uh, like his trench coat or whatever and like doesn't talk to other humans <laughs> and like laughs derisively whenever the teachers say anything to him and also seems like really hopped up all of the time hey he's actually on a lot of Adderall and someone should do something yeah. about it like just go to the fucking teacher tell them that <laughs> Uh, but no guess what bailey just makes the mess and she's like i'll just ghost everyone after the summer over the summer i'll just disappear which summer i mean as plans go it's not the worst plan it's definitely the easiest it's definitely the easiest her roommate emily also stays on campus during spring break and bailey notices emily's behavior is very strange She's jittery. She's restless. She's got mood swings. It's almost like she's like going through withdrawals <laughs> or something. That's so weird because like the drug dealers left school, and now it's like she's with going through withdrawal <laughs> symptoms. I'm just, mm. I mean, what could be going? Listen, on? Anna. There's no way for for Bailey to know anything about withdrawal. It's not like she also went through withdrawal like a few pages ago when she stopped taking (gasps) Adderall. It's not like she has any experience with withdrawal. It's also not like she has Google, except for that part where she like did totally Google meth and like how to make meth and like (laughs) what the signs of meth (laughs) meth usage was. So like I don't know. I mean, she she was sure she could erase her browsing history. Like she didn't just hit Control Shift N and open an incognito tab. Like (laughs) she she really went to town on the Wikipedia page about meth, but stopped at withdrawal. She was like, I don't need to know about this. Yeah, she didn't want to know about that. She didn't want to know about people not taking the drug. She just wanted to know about them (laughs) doing it. Because that's how she makes money. True, true. So the science club returns from their trip and they're all beautiful and tan. And (laughs) Emily is like, tell me where Warren is. I need to speak with him immediately. And Bailey's like, weird, but okay, this is where he is. And so Emily runs off and, I don't know, Bailey goes and does something. I think she goes out to dinner with Warren at some fancy restaurant afterwards. And when she comes back to her dorm room, she finds Emily lifeless in her bed with blue lips. Meth lips. <laughs> she still hasn't put the pieces together. <laughs> the, Bailey's, the, like, Bailey's like Simba in the Lion King. She just goes over and lifts Emily's hand. Yeah, like, she's like pushing Emily. on her dad's face with her paws. Warren shows up behind her like Scar and is like, run, run away. Yeah, and run never and return. never come back. This is all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> But then instead of hanging out eating grubs with Timon and Pumbaa, she does something else. <laughs> I mean, that might, uh, be, that might be a fun away. name for a, a fun euphemism for what she ends up doing, eating grubs. Yeah, yeah. She just goes to that grub buffet. <laughs> really goes to town on those grubs. Oh, you hear about Bailey? Yeah, she ate a bunch of grubs. Oh, poor thing. Yep. Poor thing. <laughs> she grubbed out. Um, the paramedics, <laughs> the paramedics come and take Emily away and the police come to question Bailey. Turns out Emily was taking meth and OD'd because the new batch was a lot stronger. Like it was twice the potency of what she was used to. 
And also probably because she like was in a period of withdrawal and hadn't had meth for a while and was like then probably came back and took a shit ton of meth is probably also part of it. Overdid it. (laughs) So Bailey blames almost like someone else was responsible. Like almost like someone else who like you know that guy who like was her dealer but then like left and didn't leave her the drugs that she had come to depend on and you know that guy who like did change the formula for the meth that she was using and didn't tell her about it like it almost seems like it's kind of his fault and not actually his Bailey's fault, fault at all in Bailey. any way shape or form like if we're going to be pointing but the Bailey finger here. put the ingredients together Bailey so did put the ingredients her. together you're right you're right <laughs> So this comes to my question then, now that now that the whole Emily situation is out in the open. If Emily was addicted to meth and knew that her roommate was involved in a club with the people that make and deal the meth, why wouldn't she then just be like, hey, you got the hookup, Bailey? <laughs> I don't want to have to talk to Warren anymore. Why wouldn't she also then be like, hey, Bailey, I'm not going to say you got the hookup because that seemed to confuse you a lot last time. Um... But are you doing meth or other drugs? Because I'm addicted to them currently, and Warren got me involved in that when I was dating him, and maybe you shouldn't. Like, maybe you shouldn't. Maybe, maybe you like, shouldn't. maybe you shouldn't take the drugs, Bailey. I'm aware. Like, if we're going to just be assigning blame to people for being aware of things and not fully disclosing everything, it seems like kind of everyone's at fault. Because it seems like Emily definitely mm-hmm. should have told Bailey something aside from, like, hey. Yes, aside from, like. Be careful okay, around we'll- around Warren. Like, that yeah. has a lot of. Because, honestly, that could have had absolutely nothing to do with the drugs. It could have been the fact that he was, like, kind of an abusive asshole. Which I'm kind of split on how much of, like how much I'm willing to to classify his behavior as abusive. Because I think, like, in an adult relationship, it definitely would be. But as a teen, it's kind of just, yeah. like, it seems like you don't know how to have a relationship because you're a fucking child. Like, Yeah, who has a lot of, like, abandonment issues already. Yeah, it's not good, but I can give you a little more leeway for it. But either mm-hmm. way, I feel like Emily probably should have fucking come out and told Bailey, hey, how about all that yeah. meth, huh? What's the deal with that? I mean, they have, like, huge screaming fights about it. And wouldn't it just be, like, the best way to win an argument? To be like, well, Warren got me addicted to meth. Right. And then what would Bailey say? Like, you win the argument, Emily. Good. Why Why didn't you? <laughs> I guess I guess Emily's concern was that Bailey didn't know anything about the meth despite hanging out with the guys who made the meth all of the time and probably making meth but herself. But they have a conversation but- where she's like, you know how Warren gets all his money, don't you? And then, like, Emily tells this weird lie. Like, Bailey asks her. She's like, you know how Warren gets all his money, don't you? And Emily is like, oh, yeah, his grandparents give it to him. Well, I think... So, like, I think, what was that? <laughs> I think Emily is under the assumption. This is what I'm saying. I think Emily's under the assumption that Bailey is so sweet and innocent and does not know. Mm. And so that if she was like, yes, I do know. Warren gets his money from the meth. Like, the meth that he got me addicted to. She would win the argument, Mm -hmm. but if she was correct in her thinking that Bailey did not know, Bailey would then be like, Math, I must go tell headmaster. And like then Emily (laughs) would end up getting in trouble. So I think I think that is the overriding theme of this book is like teens being afraid of getting in trouble with their school principal. (laughs) Which is like a wild thing for a book about meth. Yeah. Yeah. So like <laughs> the 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 problem isn't the meth. The problem is the distrust of authority figures. I mean, I think that is well, I was going to say I think that is kind of like the thing because that it like there are many points where Bailey could have told I guess if you wanted to take a message away from this, it would be like mm-hmm. don't struggle through shit alone. Go talk to an adult, which is a good message. Except that Bailey does eventually tell all of this to an adult, as we're about to get to. She tells all yes. of this to her father and stepmother, and they are very helpful. Her stepmom and is like, fancy pants lawyer. Yes, and her stepmom's like, hey, like, I'm so sorry. You know, we haven't been as supportive as we needed to be. Um, your dad is upset, but he's dealing with it. Like, we're going to get through this. And it's, like, basically the best possible outcome. And if the moral of the story was, like, go talk to a trusted adult. It's going to be okay. That would be great. Like, the book but it's not. There. 
That's yeah. not what the end of the story is. Oh my god. It was so frustrating. Like, I understand that you got a lot of things going on in your mind. This, the blame, the guilt, and everything is riding on you. But, like, the fact that you have two people, like, one, a super high-powered lawyer on your side and your dad, and you've, like, confessed all of this, and you know that they're going to help you pick up the pieces. I just, like, why did it have to go on? Because the the people at, at uh, I almost said Scholastic, at Simon & Schuster gave their ghostwriter <laughs> an outline of how to write an anonymous diary drug book, because this is how mm-hmm. I think all of the anonymous diary drug books go, um, and they have to end the same way. And it's true. It's like a Nicholas Sparks book. Yep. I mean, like Annie's baby doesn't because it's not a drug book. Like the ones that are yeah, drug that books. Yeah, that is true. I Just think I'll end book. this way. I could be wrong. I haven't read like Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. I don't know how that one goes. Um, but you know, I'm probably not gonna. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, just you know, after after we uh, finish Animorphs, we just dive into all the Anonymous Diary series. I think yeah, that'd be a sure. really good follow up. Not that we we are secretly having plans to do more Animorphs very soon. Oh yeah, no, Animorphs <laughs> doesn't exist. We hate Animorphs that doesn't book. exist, guys. Don't worry I about mean, it. Books. <laughs> Um, so Bailey c- confesses and gets advice about what to do, and her mom, her stepmom is like, you gotta leave the science club, dude. Bailey's like, okay, okay. Well, her I'll stepmom's try. like, you have to go tell them to knock it off, and then don't have anything more to do. Well, like, that too. Mm-hmm. She's like, convince them all to stop. I'm like, no, no, stepmom, no. You've given them- She has no responsibility to do that. You've given her good legal advice up to this point, but like, no. <laughs> Uh, and, and then the school gives the news that Emily has died. So Bailey goes to confront the science club about what happened, and they're pretty much unsympathetic. And Warren's like, addict's gonna addict, and wipes his hands of the situation. And at this point, it, it's very clear that Warren is like a full-blown addict as well. Like, he has a very serious yes. drug problem, and Bailey's talked to him about it several times, and he doesn't seem like he's really gonna change anything about it. Yes. Um... And so Bailey destroys some lab equipment and then goes back to her room and just takes a bunch of Percocets and dies. The end. Yep. (laughs) So she takes a bunch of Percocets and then, like, I I guess she's writing in her diary as she's doing this, which seems wild. Yeah, she's like, like, I'll just take a few more. (laughs) Which, like, it's very coherent for someone drifting off into the sweet embrace of death. Like, I don't know. But then, like, there's a newspaper article at the end that's like, oh, Bailey died. She's dead. But we have her diary, so we'll find out more. Yeah, yeah. So I guess we are supposed to assume that Warren and the rest eventually do get in trouble because she's named all of them in her Mm -hmm. diary. Um, But it's certainly not shown on the page. And it seems very crazy for a book that's like, the problem is not the addict. The problem is the drug dealer to then have the girl die yeah. of her addiction. Because I know, yes. I don't think it's clear that she's trying to commit suicide. I, I don't know that she's trying no, to eat No, she drugs, just wants to, like, but like, chill. Yeah, I think she's just trying to chill. I, I think it was an accidental overdose, not... Yeah, because, like, for the whole spring break, she was, like, consistently taking Percocets mm-hmm. and, like... Emily's withdrawals were keeping her awake despite the Percocet. So I think she was like slowly taking more and more and more. And I think she says and something like, oh, my tolerance and... is so high now. I have to take more. Yeah. I have to take the whole bottle. And it's like, okay, well, you don't. <laughs> I thought you were smart, Bailey. And again, this would be a very sad story if this happened, but it didn't. <laughs> but it didn't really. Um, and then my other question is, and maybe this is me being like, naive or outdated i don't know but like isn't it very obvious when someone is addicted to meth like because doesn't there aren't there like a lot of hallucinations that go on with that and so you always get like the stereotypical like the person is like peeling their own skin off and like losing their Um, teeth and stuff or is that not a real thing that's just i mean i think I definitely think that there are symptoms of meth use, but like, I guess I don't, I guess I don't know how much it would, I think a lot of the symptoms of meth use are, that are visible might also 
kind of be made more um, obvious by like uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, environmental factors, like you mm-hmm. know, like the the rotting teeth and stuff. It's like that's maybe not going to happen as quickly if you are rich and in a boarding school and like have access to good dental care. Like, yeah, uh, maybe like she's able to hide these symptoms more i don't know she's not that far gone yet. yeah i don't know there's a certain look that's like stereotypically associated with meth usage i don't know how much of that is accurate i guess but i i do think that more than like a lot of other drugs it does have like physical side effects that you should be able to see but also Bailey's stupid so like she's very stupid my other question is like what is the deal with warren like getting people addicted to drugs and then wanting to cut them off except bailey like bailey he wants to share all of his drugs with but emily like he gets her addicted to meth and then seems to be very reluctant to sell her anymore because they're always having these like weird conversations about it and then Katie, he gets her addicted to Adderall and then doesn't want to sell her any more Adderall. I'm just like, what is what I, was with that? I think that's actually, like, an interesting character trait that, like, mm-hmm. I wish we could have gotten more into Warren's psyche. Like, because I think that, like, it... Yeah. You, you could make the, the inference that Warren is trying to... Um, because, like you said, he has this, like, whole sad, tragic backstory about his brother who died from addiction. Um and like his parents basically don't love him as much as they loved his brother seems to be the case uh so like if he has a lot of pent-up anger towards his brother who was an addict and he wants to punish his brother like maybe he's kind of i'm kind of like criminal mindsing this a little bit but maybe he's like (laughs) getting these other people addicted so that he can withhold drugs and like punish them in the way that like he can't really punish his brother um because then he keeps he whenever this happens he like comes back with like oh they're just weak they can't stop because they're addicts so it does seem like it's very much like a a psychological response to his earlier trauma with his brother um but yeah it's pretty wild for a thing to be like kind of happening in the background and not really fully explored (laughs) (laughs) yeah um it was definitely like I understand this was supposed to be all from Bailey's point of view, but her point of view was so boring, and I just wanted there to be more of the other characters. Yeah. Again, like, I get why it's from Bailey's point of view, because it's, as I've said, propaganda, and it's trying to be like, number one, this could happen to anybody. It could happen to anybody. Yeah, and number two, it's going to be Bailey and not Katie because Bailey is the innocent. And isn't it so sad to see this tragic fall from grace for this, you know, sweet, sweet white angel. The likable girl. The <laughs> likable girl. Exactly. So we can't have it be Katie and we can't have it be Warren because, you know, their their problems are too much, I think, for like, well, I, I don't really know what Katie's problem is. It's not explored. She just seems like kind of a sociopath. Um but Warren especially like we can't get into them because they're not likable they they aren't sweet and innocent and naive like yeah you know um they're not as blank as Bailey is that you could insert yourself into the book but the problem with having like a sweet naive innocent character in a book about being a drug kingpin is like you have to accept that either she's not like she either has to be not that sweet and innocent um or she has to be a hypocrite or she has to be stupid like those are your options uh because <laughs> and i feel like this one kind of landed on like a little bit of hypocrite little bit of stupid because she wasn't as stupid as she could have been but she was pretty stupid <laughs> uh, i'm just glad to be done with this one yeah i guess we don't really have to talk about uh what we would like and i mean i don't think we're gonna make a whole unit out of drug no. books maybe we will one day i would like if if i had to read another diary style of book mm. i would want it to be in the form of like someone's twitter feed or tumblr and mm. <laughs> include pictures 
<laughs> I'd rather just go read someone's Tumblr. <laughs> yeah, that's true too. If I was going to read another drug book, I would like for it to make sense would be my main complaint. That too. Like, I want it to be like actually representative of what it is like to become addicted to a hard drug like meth. Yeah. And I'm not saying that, that rich kids can't be addicted to meth. I'm sure there are rich kids addicted to meth. Oh, yeah, no. But, like, uh, I don't know. It just seems like a really weird choice to me to talk about. Because a lot of, uh, we're saying meth, but there's a lot of, like, stuff about the opioid ec- epidemic and stuff like that in here, too. And it yeah. seems like a very weird choice to me to be like, we need to focus on spoiled rich kids and their Exactly. opioid usage who have the resources of, to right you know get rid of the or not get rid of the addiction but overcome the addiction right um considering like and again not saying that rich people don't use op- opioids because of course they do but like mm-hmm. the widespread opioid epidemic is very specifically affecting a class of people that is not rich children in boarding schools like not saying that they're all aren't also affected but like they shouldn't be the focus of this story right more relatable characters i guess yeah but is there a book that this reminded you of are are you reading any other drug books that you can recommend or something Um, similar I've got actually th- alternate reading three this week, which I know is a lot, um, and I'll try to go through them mm. quickly. But I had three from like different angles. Uh, first off, from the okay. diary angle, I'm gonna go ahead and plug Princess Diaries by Meg Cabot. It's like super <laughs> cheesy, and I fucking love it. Like it's one of my all time favorite series. Um, if you've seen the movie, one of my first memories of knowing you <laughs> is you gained access to the Tenth Princess Diaries book, and you just went in your room and locked the door and read it, and that yeah. was like one of my first impressions of you. Yeah, and then you came down like three hours later. And you're like, it's a good book. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking love that series. It's it's super super cheesy in like the best way possible. Um, it, and it was also <laughs> probably one of the first YA books that I read because I think I got the third one from like a library readathon thing where I was, like, slightly too old mm-hmm. for the other books. So I was like, I guess I'll read this, and uh, mm-hmm. I'm obsessed with it still. I still love that series. <laughs> um, so because like the diaries. Uh, book two is a drug book, and it's a nonfiction one. Um, oh. trying, to, trying to get more into nonfiction, but this is actually one that I read a while ago, uh, called Dope Sick, Dealers, Doctors, and the Drug Company that Addicted America by Beth Macy, which is about the opioid cr- crisis and kind of – how we got to this point um and it's a really good nice. look at it and obviously a realistic look um because it's nonfiction. i don't read nonfiction, but that does sound good so that one that's that's fun if you want to actually not it's not fun um that's interesting if you want to actually like look into kind of this subject <laughs> and then my last pick is a book that i actually just started reading but it kind of is resonating a little bit with this one um, and I think we've talked about this author before, uh, but not Beatrice Sparks. No, um, Tahira Mafi, who <laughs> wrote the Baby. the Shatter Me series. I think we might have mentioned on here before. Oh yeah. Uh-huh. Um, so she has a book called A Very Large Expanse of Sea, which is about a girl who starts That's at a new relatively school. New, isn't it? Yes, it's uh, 2018, I think. Mm-hmm. But it's a girl who starts at a new school. Uh, shortly after 9-11 and she happens to be hijabi and uh is dealing with like all of the backlash of people against muslim Mm. in america post 9-11 like this is like it's set like a couple months after 9-11 i think okay interesting i had no idea what that book was yeah it's it's i'm only a little bit into it it's really good so far and i really like the main character um uh, and it's like deals with a lot of these issues of like teenage loneliness and not needing to or not being able to like go and talk to an adult about because like there are adults at the school who are like basically abusive to her um, in their <laughs> in their attitudes. Uh, so like she can't she doesn't have that support system. Um, and it's like, you know, also a book about young love and that sort of thing. But it's also dealing with, like, these serious issues of, like, racism and how 
we as a nation yeah. responded to a national tragedy with extreme prejudice like uh that we're still dealing yeah. with today so like us uh, like i said i'm not all the way through that one so i don't know maybe the main character also dies of a drug overdose <laughs> at the end uh in which case i retract my <laughs> could happen in case i probably retract my uh recommendation but so far i'm really enjoying it how about you do you've got any any picks this week yeah, I actually, I also had multiple books. I have two books, but the only reason I picked two is because I couldn't describe either of them well enough because I've forgotten entirely what Excellent. they're about, but they both reminded me of this. So um, I do enjoy liking both of these books. I have very good impressions of both of these books. Um, but the first one is called Lexicon by Max Berry, mm-hmm. which is basically about um, people who are very charismatic, can go to a school where they learn how to uh, basically the art of coercion but almost in like a magical way like they're just Hmm. extremely good at at convincing people to do whatever they want and there are a lot of rules about how like you can't tell people your real name and you can't really tell people um you don't want people to get close because then that gives them power over Mm you um but one student um also named Emily, makes a mistake and she falls in love with another student and um, she goes from being like the prodigy of the school to bad things happen from there. And and it's told like alongside of another story about a man named Will and it's kind of like a memento style thing where it tells his story in the future and then flashes back to her story in the past and then they meet towards the end. Um, So it's like really interestingly told and will like you don't understand what he has to do with any of this until you get more towards the end. Mm. So I don't want to spoil anything there. But um, that was very good. It it you know kind of has the school setting and then something bad, making mistake at a school, and then the consequences of that mistake and how they play out. But more spec ficky. And then mm-hmm. um, the course. second book is Special Topics and Calamity Physics by Marisha Pessel. Um, which is, from what I can remember, a book about a girl who goes to some sort of like elite prestigious school and falls in with a very clicky, secretive group of friends and a teacher that's in charge of them. And then someone drowns and there is a lot of mysteries that are unveiled and the main character just kind of has to sift through it all. And... It also kind of has the same vibe to it. I don't want to give them a lot away. No one dies of a drug overdose at the end, from what I can remember. But um, it definitely is not a happy tale. So Cool. So next fortnight, we are back on uh, my unit, which is Cyberpunk. Um, and Hooray! Oh my gosh, yes, I have to pull this up. We're going to be reading uh, Anna, uh, a book that Anna found that she believes, I guess, typifies the genre. Yeah, well, I don't, I guess I just see it a lot on these lists of like best cyberpunk books. Mm-hmm. And um, it's been getting a lot of attention lately because there's a new Netflix series. Um, the book is Altered Carbon by Richard hey, I'm Morgan, so surprised. The first book in the Takeshi Kovac series. Yeah, yeah. So you knew. You knew. I figured it out um, from the clues. The clues were all there. <laughs> <laughs> so I I think it, some of the editions of the book are a little bit longer, but when I chose this book, the paperback edition was 375 pages. So apologies if it's a tiny bit longer. <laughs> Um, or a lot a bit longer. Sorry. I'm hoping it's good and that makes up for it. <laughs> well, we shall see, won't we? Yes. And so it's a little bit more modern. It was first published in 2002. Um, and it, had all, it won the Philip K. Dick Award and um, just is really renowned. So I've been wanting to read it for a while. Hopefully it lives up to my expectations and hopefully I don't bore you too much with this one. <laughs> God, the Kindle version is 544 pages. Oh, my God. Wow, you fucked us. You fucked us so hard. I did fuck us. (laughs) Oh, my God. But the paperback version is 375 pages for the paperback version. So I don't know what the difference is between the two. I'm buying the paperback because it's shorter. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like I should buy the Kindle version just so that 
can compare notes to see if I read a completely different book, but we'll see. Yeah, maybe there's like 200 more pages of action in the Kindle version. <laughs> so that's what we're doing next fortnight. In the meantime, if you have done meth, let us know about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. Uh, sure. <laughs> Hit us up on Twitter at ShelfAwareCast. Anonymously, if you like. Yeah, anonymously or not. Uh, hit us up on Twitter at ShelfAwareCast. Up to you. Or um, if you have any book recommendations, any submissions of your own, uh, you can email those yeah. to us, uh, ShelfAwareCast at gmail.com. We have obviously showed we are willing to read anything. Just anything. <laughs> any, any detritus you scoop out of the gutter. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah do us a solid and send us a good book <laughs> <laughs> save us as always thank you to ben cope for the use of our theme song you can find his youtube channel in our show notes below and we are also on all of your favorite podcast aggregating platforms so if you haven't followed or subscribed to us on one of those you definitely should because i know you are all very excited to hear us talk about more cyberpunk and new adult in the future plus some other fun things that we have coming your way that may or may not be Animorphs related. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you use Apple Podcasts, we'd very much appreciate a five-star review. And even if you don't use Apple Podcasts, you can talk about us anywhere you want. Uh, just let us know, because if you do, we will send you some stickers and a little note maybe with them that we wrote. Um, and then you can show off how much you love us and Shelf Aware to all of your friends. We also have um, just launched a YouTube channel where I'm uploading oh, yeah. all of these if anybody prefers listening to podcasts on YouTube. Um, so I don't know. We're, we're trying to make it easy for you guys to, to listen to us wherever you want to listen to us. Uh, but, yeah, you know, we'll see. <laughs> so if, if you like YouTube <laughs> podcasts, we're over there now, too. So enjoy. We might also eventually upload like bonus content and things like that over there. Uh, we're working on a few ideas. Yeah, we're saving all of our best jokes for YouTube. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In the words of maybe Bailey, maybe Beatrice Sparks' ghost, <laughs> for such a chemistry geek, he has swagger for days. <laughs> it, important to note, days is in all capital letters. <laughs> <laughs> that was important to note. Thank you. But, fuck, I had a point and a joke, but now I can't remember what it was. Give me a sec. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is going to be a very pause-heavy episode. Maybe you um, should take an Adderall so you could focus. <laughs> <laughs> There's the stinger. <laughs>